If China threatens our sovereignty, concerns directly with China. The DOD says that China, quote, remains our most consequential strategic competitor for coming decades. Hi, I'm Kylie, just another Army vet, and today I'm reacting to why the U.S. military is preparing for war with China. And this comes from a channel by the name of Johnny Harris. Now, I've not actually seen any of his videos yet, but he comes highly recommended. So please go check out his channel, and I will link it down below. Let's get to it. There's a small volcanic island off the southern coast of Japan called Magashima. Nobody lives here. But here's footage from January 2023 of construction workers arriving to this island. Their task is to build a couple of runways on the island and some storage facilities for ammunition. The Japanese government has been paying local fishermen to stay away from this island. That's because they're turning it into a military base. The island is being built by Japan, but one of its main purposes has to do with the United States. American fighter jets and aircraft carriers have had to do their drills and practices down here on this island, but now they're able to station at this island, moving them much closer to this ocean and to one country in particular. Magashima is just one of many islands that are being loaded up with military hardware, most of it coming from the United States. It's part of this chain of militarized islands, an effort of defense or aggression, depending on how you look at it. It's a line that centers on Taiwan. And it's what one official was referring to when they said that 2023 is likely to stand as the most transformative year in US force posture in this region in a generation. This line is a symbol of the rising tensions between global superpowers. And I wanna show you why this is happening now and what it means for the future of this conflict. This is unlike anything the US Navy has done since World War II. Tensions are rising in one of the most hotly contested regions on the planet, the South China Sea. So thank you, Copilot, for sponsoring today's video. Let's dive back into this important story. Here we go. Okay, so this document from the U.S. Department of Defense. This document is called the National Defense Strategy of the United States of America, which also includes the Nuclear Posture Review and Missile Defense Review. It's basically a report that they release every four years that gives us an understanding of what the U.S. military is up to, what they care about. China and this year's Russia. is more detailed than normal. The document focuses a lot on China. If China threatens our sovereignty, concerns directly with China. The DOD says that China, quote, remains our most consequential strategic competitor for coming decades. Why? Because, the Pentagon says, China is bullying its neighbors to, quote, reshape the region and the international system to fit its authoritarian preferences. In other words, China is a bit of a bully. And you see how they actually fly into Taiwanese airspace probably every single day. And they also have issues with Filipino fishermen, I believe. And you also see on the news that they do actually come really close to our planes as well as our Navy ships. So yeah, China has issues with everyone. And something to think about is that they share a border with, I want to say, about 14 countries. Yet, somehow, they have territory or border disputes with at least 18. Now, remember that the United States, who spends loads on its military, has set the rules for our global order. How we trade, what political systems we favor, who participates in the system. And now we see a country that wants to dethrone them, to create a new system based on other values and other rules. We need a poo. And what scares the U.S. military is that China is rapidly modernizing and expanding their military. China's military is growing incredibly fast. Like, they deploy the equivalent of an entire new British Navy every four years. Every four years is like new, new British Navy, like new Royal Navy every four years. Yeah, they're just growing very quickly. But how big is the Royal Navy, though? 
because when I think of the Royal Navy, I don't think of them as one of the largest navies in the world. I mean, maybe they are, I'm just not sure. This report is concerned about China's growing strength and military footprint. India actually just surpassed China as the world's largest military. How China is coercing its neighbors, disregarding ocean boundaries, testing missiles, bullying fishing vessels in other countries' waters, building islands and military bases on those islands, and flying over other countries' airspace. And especially in Taiwan, the island that China claims as their own and where the globe gets nearly all of their advanced microchips, which is a topic I made an entire video about. The point is Taiwan is an incredibly important island for the United States. All of this together makes China, quote, the only country that has the intent and power to actually challenge the US-led global order and rewrite global rules and norms, something the US has gotten really comfortable doing over the last 70 years. So this is why the US considers China the most consequential strategic competitor Editor for coming decades. And they've created a plan to respond. And in their words, we cannot delay. They give themselves this 10 year window to implement some major changes. And this is what it looks like. Okay, first things first, the US military is already very present in Asia. We've got about 8,000 troops in Guam. We've got over 100 bases in Japan with about 21,000 American troops on the mainland and another 24,000 stationed down here on the Japanese island of Okinawa. The Marines' largest division outside of the United States is the 3rd Division, I believe, and they're actually stationed in Okinawa to South Korea and you'll find 22,000 US troops. And then you've got the US Navy who operates out of this port in Singapore. This has been the status quo in Asia for decades. And it has been the way that the US has ensured security for its allies. And it's kind of mostly worked to help secure American interests and deter conflict. The US has maintained strong alliances in this region. And frankly, the Pentagon has kind of been distracted with other things. Two wars that happened in the Middle East over the past 20 years. My fellow citizens, my fellow citizens, my fellow citizens. But as those conflicts wind down yeah. and as China militarizes, the Department of Defense says that this status quo, all of these troops in Asia, it's not enough. They talk about this new kind of deterrence, integrated deterrence, the only kind of military posture that will actually keep China at bay. And this is what it looks like. The smallest part of the strategy has to do with American bases. They're gonna reopen a base in Guam and move some troops there. But the majority of this strategy has to do with American allies in Asia, allies that are in lockstep with the US's goal to deter and contain China. The Pentagon calls partnering with its allies the center of gravity for this strategy. So let's start with Japan, one of the US's closest allies in the region. Japan is a country that is deeply concerned about a more powerful China with its massive navy and its ambitions to control Taiwan. And it's very easy to forget that Japan isn't just this. It's actually all of this. Mm -hmm. It extends way down here because of all these islands. These islands curve nicely all the way down till they hit Taiwan. All of these are Japanese islands. I mean, if you look at Japan's national defense strategy translated into English, you will see something that looks strikingly similar to what the Pentagon released. They're both really freaked out about China and they both are ready to act in lockstep to deter a more aggressive China in the region. So it starts up here with that island that we talked about at the beginning, Magashima, this new military base and airstrip to be used by both Japanese and US militaries. Further south is Amami Island, where Japan has recently added long range missiles and anti-ship missiles. Potentially they're gonna add cruise missiles. These are missiles that they're buying from the United States. These are missiles that are definitely in range of the Taiwan Strait. Next to the chain is Okinawa, where the US has a huge huge presence of tens of thousands of troops already. Japan also has military bases here and is adding even more long range missiles and electronic warfare units for military installations mm. meant to disrupt and deny communication signals. On these two islands down here, they're adding even more long range missiles, which could potentially be used to attack Chinese naval ships and aircraft. And Japan is placing nearly 600 troops on Ishigaki as well. And finally, you've got this last militarized island in the chain. Yonaguni, it's the closest island to Taiwan. And here Japan is adding more of those electronic warfare units, which are used to jam communication signals or to listen in on their communications. You know, they're right next to China. Japan is also positioning more troops here. So this is the first part of our chain. 
And when paired with training that Japan and US troops are doing to simulate island and amphibious warfare, it sends a really strong signal to China that Japan is ready to respond if needed. This line also serves as like a physical barrier that any Chinese ship or submarine would have to pass through in order to access the Pacific Ocean. It's a line that Japan can easily control and monitor. And it also builds a wall of missiles. Any calculus that China is making on whether or not to invade Taiwan or to do anything in the region will have to now factor in this wall of missiles ready to roll. Overall, this increased military presence on this chain of islands gives Japan, and by extension the United States, the ability to monitor communications and troop movements of China, preparing them to act quickly. And it also gives them the ability to pre-position troops and supplies throughout the region, which is a major logistical advantage. But all of this comes with a massive price tag. China is not stupid. They know exactly what the US, Japan, and its allies are doing. The problem is that we are preparing for war at China, but we're kind of also provoking China. So the question is, how long can we actually poke the bear before they actually strike first? So Japan, which is formerly a pacifist nation without like a huge military, is actually planning to double their defense spending. They're spending way more on buying weapons than they ever have before. And 97% of those weapons are coming from the United States. So technically Japan doesn't even have a military. They actually have a defense force. And that was something that came about as a part of the surrender during World War II. The island chain strategy continues down here with the Philippines, close to Taiwan and close to the South China Sea. The US knows that it needs to bolster its presence here, but it's not as straightforward as it is in Japan. The Philippines was a US colony for decades. It's a very sensitive history. And even after Filipino independence, the US maintained a military presence in the Philippines until like the 90s. And then they eventually kicked out the US as many saw it as just an enduring legacy of US colonialism. But a more aggressive China has become a major threat to the Philippines. Now listen, I'm not gonna go into like a full South China Sea thing here, but just know that China claims all of this as their maritime boundary. It's literally a line with nine dashes that some Chinese official in 1948 drew by hand on a map. This line blasts through the boundaries that the rest of the world recognizes as the Filipino territorial waters. And this is why the Philippines and Vietnam both have been trying to get their hands on India and Russia's BrahMos missile. So there's a conflict in the ocean. And now on a daily basis, Filipino fishing vessels are harassed by Chinese military vessels who threaten them if they don't leave their waters. In 2022, China put a temporary stop to all fishing in the South China Sea, denying the Philippines ability to fish in the West Philippine Sea, which is rightfully their waters. But it's crazier than that. The Chinese Navy is like full blown, just bullying the Philippines. They like show up with lasers to harass and blind Filipino ships. I mean, let's remember the Philippines is a much smaller nation than China and doesn't really have a Navy even close to what China has. So now they're in this impossible decision. They have to choose between giving up their sovereignty and fishing rights to their aggressive neighbor, China, or partnering with their former colonizer who also wants to repel China. And in this case, they chose the latter. China has pushed too hard. It's pushed the Philippines in the South China Sea, what they call the West Philippine Sea. But the Philippines is planning to boost its military presence in the disputed South China Sea. It started in 2014 when they allowed the US back in for the first time in 22 years. The US presence will technically be in bases that are owned by the Philippines, but the US can have troops, build barracks and other military installations and can have pre-positioned supplies there as well. It's basically like the US has bases there, but it's like, shh, it's actually the Philippines. And as part of all of this that we've been talking about in late 2022, they expanded their agreement, giving the US military access to four more bases, bringing the total number of bases on the Philippines up to nine. And look where they selected to put them, here in the north of the country, mm -hmm. strategically close to Taiwan, and helping fill their gap in their island chain that they're creating. This now allows US to have a military presence really close to Taiwan. The US trains very closely with their Filipino counterparts, making them ready to respond very quickly to an invasion in Taiwan, while also repelling Chinese bullying of Filipino fishing activity. Okay, so now the island chain is filling out, giving the US and its regional partners a solid blockade to the Pacific. And it continues
continues all the way down around the South China Sea because of the US presence in Singapore. This is a very united front, but it doesn't stop here. The last part of the strategy is potentially the most significant, and it has to do with Australia, a country that is also alarmed by China's rise in the region. So there's this military pact between the US, the UK, and Australia. It's called AUKUS. What it means is that these three countries will work together to create a unified submarine force that will patrol the Pacific. First, what it means is that the US is giving, giving nuclear submarine technology, its most powerful and advanced weapon, freely to Australia. Here, here are the designs to our most powerful weapons. Take them, foreign country. And then the US and UK will base submarines out of this port here in Australia. It's called Perth. Australian sailors will ride alongside US and UK sailors during submarine deployments. They will learn together, they will work together, they will share classified intelligence. What this means is that there will be a significantly larger number of submarines patrolling these waters. And remember, these are nuclear powered submarines, which we made a whole video on as well. These things can be underwater for months. They can go on these long patrols over to Taiwan and the South China Sea. They can close up these key choke points, plugging holes in their growing line against China. So I wanna clarify a few things. One, Australia did not receive all that stuff for free. They had to pay for it. And second, he's talking about nuclear powered submarines. That does not mean that those submarines are roaming around the ocean with nuclear bombs. And crucially, we can be pretty damn certain that a lot of these submarines will be carrying nuclear weapons, adding yet another layer of deterring power to an already really powerful line of defense. Australia does not possess nuclear weapons. However, the US and Great Britain does. And if this wasn't enough, Australia is also building a permanent hangar for US B-52 bombers up here in the Tyndall Air Base in Northern Australia. These US bombers carry conventional weapons, but they also carry nukes. So now US bombers carrying nuclear weapons will have a permanent home in Australia. There's gonna be a lot more military hardware in the Pacific because of this. Hardware that carries the most powerful and dangerous weapons we have. This is a very aggressive signal to China that the West is ready. So now, if you look at the whole thing, this whole chain, you see how robust this presence is. This is what that military official meant by transformative. The military name for this is the first island chain, and it is at the heart of the US and its allies' strategy to counter and contain China. And it's easy to see that this island chain, while protecting a lot of different interests for a lot of different countries, really centers on Taiwan. A major purpose for all of this militarization, the missiles, the subs, the air bases, the troops, is to prepare for conflict in Taiwan. And this is where we get to the paradox of deterrence. You prepare to fight so that you don't have to fight. All of this preparation might be just what is needed for China to decide that it would be too costly to invade Taiwan. But the other side of that paradox is that all of this looks an awful lot like overt escalation in a conflict. If you're China, this chain of islands is clearly your enemy trying to box you in, to monitor your every move. A superpower from the other side of the world flooding your region with more military hardware to stop your influence. So Johnny said that perfectly, and you can actually take his words and also apply it to the Russia situation as well. It would be impossible for this plan to not contribute to a rising of tensions between the two superpowers. All this as the U.S. prepares for a potential conflict with China. How close are we to all-out conflict between the world's two largest superpowers? Chinese President Xi Jinping has already called this a policy of encirclement and suppression. And let's be honest, he's right. Whether you like it or not, this is containment. Old school, Cold War style containment. It's hard not to see it when you look at this map. And the Chinese foreign minister said that it would literally be impossible for China to not fight back to take a move that retaliates against this move. Which means that if the US and its allies aren't careful with all of this, it may send a signal to China that now is the time 
to invade Taiwan before all of this plan can fully be implemented. In that sense, this strategy could provoke the very conflict that it is trying to deter. Again, same thing with the US and NATO and Russia. So one thing he did not mention, which kind of surprised me, was that Carrier Strike Group 5, also called the Ronald Reagan Carrier Strike Group, is actually based in Japan. So that would be a huge asset for all of our forces in the Pacific. But anyway, I think he did an amazing job with this video. He and his team were on point with the research, content, editing, and the graphics. One thing that I don't think people fully understand is that war with China is inevitable. It's like a ticking time bomb just waiting to go off. And I think it's going to happen sooner rather than later. Most likely it's going to happen when China fulfills its promise and actually invades Taiwan. Before I let you guys go, I do have one hypothetical situation for you guys. If the world was not overly dependent on Taiwan for semiconductors, would the world and the U.S. still be as adamant on protecting Taiwan from China? Please drop that in the comments. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you do want to help support the channel, then please watch some more videos. Or you could also like, sub, share, comment, or give me a thanks.